those of you who are here and also live, and also for those of you who uh, have been patrons of this lecture series uh, this, this year, this season, um, that are gonna be watching this in the, in the friendly confines of your own a home and your own computer or your own device, whatever the case may be. Uh, this is our, our concluding symposium for the Wither Catholic Education uh, series. Um, and uh, we have therefore with us, we have our, our three presenters. Uh, we have Superintendent uh, Donna Illibrin um, um, from Albuquerque uh, Catholic Schools for the Archdiocese of Santa Fe. Okay, we have uh, Matthew Doherty, who is a, in a, a you know, associate professor of biology at Santa Fe College. And then we have uh, uh, Brother Dr. Ernest Miller, who is, you have to remind me, what is your title again? <laughs> I couldn't get it right the first time. <laughs> I am the director of what is called the Adrian Nell Project within our provincial office for mission and ministry. And that is in uh, Manhattan right now? Uh, so uh, I'm a member of our East Coast province, so it's in service to our whole East Coast province, which is from Toronto to Puerto Rico. <laughs> okay, very good. All right. So um, the, 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 what we're going to do, um, uh, as we have, we've sort of hashed it out here, is we are going to have our presenters are each going to give a synopsis of you know really kind of the you know kind of the main bullet point the main drill down for their uh, for their presentations just to kind of refresh everybody if you, if you haven't seen the lectures uh, recently um, and then uh, and then we will have uh, we will open it up to questions the presenters will ask questions or make comments about you know with respect to the their lectures first. And then we will open it up to uh, people either virtually or in our audience that also want to ask follow-up questions. I might have one or two, uh, you know, here and there. Um, and so we'll just kind of see where where the conversation goes. Uh, I just want to say that as we enter this concluding uh, a presentation, that I've been very very impressed uh, with the quality of the presentations, the quality of the discourse. I, I do feel that we have uh, added something. Uh, important to this conversation about, you know, education, I think in general, but also Catholic education uh, more specifically. And I think this is, again, as I've said before in, in uh, introducing the presenters, I think this is uh, perhaps a timely topic more now than maybe even, you know, just a few years ago. When we, we talk about all these, the implications of education, not just in the church, not just in the United States, but really in, in the world. So with that, I think we're going to, we'll take this in chronological order. So uh, Ms. Illibrin, you were the first presenter. Um, and so uh, give us a refresher of what was your, what was your sort of main, uh, the main thrust of your, of your topic? Well, thank you. Um, well, I think the main thrust of my topic was really is why Catholic education and as a former Catholic school teacher, a former administrator, um, I just have seen why we need Catholic education, whether it's catechism at church or catechism in the school, in a Catholic school where we are living our faith and teaching this to our children. Um, but more and more, it's, it's more than just that. It's because the secular world around us is just tearing down the human spirit. And I feel that it is so important that our children know that there is a God, that every child is a gift from God, and that we have a purpose, a God-given purpose. And right now, I, I really don't think that the children, a majority of them in public schools have that message. And I, I think it's very challenging for our young adults in this world today where do I fit in? How does my Lord fit into my life? We're never alone when we believe and when we know and live the life of Christ. But Christ is more than just a feeling. I mean, it's a life, it's a lifestyle, and it's service to others, caring for one another, respect for others, and really I mean, we are the apostles, we are his disciples here on earth, and it is to do good, to serve others so that we can provide a better place. I mean, when I look around us, the war is going on all over, the war, the spiritual warfare that's going on in the homes and our country and in the world, it's very challenging. And if, if our schools aren't here to support our faith and our culture, 
then what will happen? So Catholic schools play a major role in the development and formation of our children in the future. That's my thoughts on why Catholic education. Very good. And, uh, and you know, in, in your capacity, you, you deal with, again, with uh, K through 12. Correct. You know, that's, that's your jurisdiction. And so that's, you know, really the perfect handoff to, uh, you know, Father slash Dr. Matthew, because then you're, you're picking up the narrative of, of Catholic education at the university level. So, uh, you know, give us a brief synopsis of, of you know, which was, it was a tour de force, if I recall, uh, a brief synopsis of, of, your, uh, of your presentation on uh, Catholic higher education. Well, thank you. And, and I, it wasn't it, it wasn't exclusively to, to Catholic higher education, though. I think I'm most familiar with uh, higher education, um, with higher education. So I, I do sit on the board of, of a Catholic high school here in, in in Green Bay. And so I am interested in also a high school uh, secondary ed uh, and Catholic education in that respect. Uh, one of the things that I really wanted to do in my talk was to explain, or at least to to think about why this question is even coming up. Uh, why why this question seems to carry so much weight today? And so I tried to talk about uh, kind of the the Catholic American American Catholic experience um, historically to kind of show how. At first, it was very um, isolated from the rest of, of the world of education. And then there was this, uh, this great pull to integrate with the wider American culture and to kind of throw off what, try to focus on what, uh, we, share, what we share with the world rather than what, how, what makes us distinct. And kind of how that project may have gone a little bit too far to the extent that now we're in a place where if you're talking to administrators in, in colleges or high schools, or you're talking to people who, who really are, are in the, the weeds of Catholic education, this question starts to come up because uh, we have to figure out why it's worth it to go to a Catholic school, to go to a Catholic high school, to go to a Catholic college. The, the difficulty that we can face is Catholic education can be somewhat expensive for many people. And so why pay the extra money to do this? Um, but it also kind of gets to the point of what values are we putting forth? Uh, what does make us distinct, uh, especially uh, during these times when sometimes we don't necessarily have buy in for many of the people who sit on our faculties or are teaching in our classrooms. So I wanted to try to get into some of the the difficulties of of marketing and and stating the value proposition of Catholic schools to begin with, just to feel the weight of that question because it is a question that everybody seems to be asking these days. Uh, the Association of Catholic Colleges and Universities is asking this question. Uh, it seems to be something that has been renewed within higher education that maybe wasn't there as much in the late to mid, mid to late 20th century when there was more of an integrationist, uh, a desire to become more integrated and focus less on what makes us distinct, where now we focus more on what's distinct. The second half of my talk, I really wanted to focus on uh, what is the value proposition? Uh, what does make a Catholic uh, school Catholic? And I kind of talked about a couple of possibilities. One was ethics. This is something that we try that many schools will put in their mission statements to say this is what makes a school Catholic is along with your business degree, you will learn to be an ethical business leader. Um, and I said, I don't know if that's quite the way uh, forward. Um, I think the way forward in my mind was contemplation a way of seeing the world, a, a way of asking big questions that ultimately open ourselves, give, it, it uh, helps us to assume a posture to, that opens ourselves to God, which then informs our ethics, which then informs our business practices and uh, our study of the liberal arts and understanding the unity of knowledge as it relates to, the, to God. So I think the, the major thrust of my talk um, was first trying to feel the weight of the question and then two, to answer it. 
with a focus on contemplation as something that can be distinctive, uh, a distinctive way of doing education through uh, a contemplative practice that permeates the whole entire curriculum. So that was my talk on uh, why Catholic why Catholic education. Uh, I'd say a con because it trains us to be contemplatives in the world. And I just to, just to add one uh, grain to that, I believe you were also before joining the faculty at Saint Edward College. Then you were on the the board of trustees for Saint Edward College for a few years. Is that correct? Correct. Yes. 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 So, so you get you got to see that conversation in a sense, you know, taking place those types of questions both at the, the secondary ed level and at the college level. Right. So you sort of had a binocular vision on that. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Very good. So we definitely have a sense of, I think, you know, from, you know, you know Donna and Matthew, you know, the, the, the sense of faith, you know, you know, the sense of mission, I think, you know, and, and then, you know, we also want to engage, of course, and, you know, this, the, the last of the terms from the, the, the subtitle of the, the series, you know, faith, mission and pedagogy, and how that's going to, that's going to move into this as well. And so I have maybe some thoughts, maybe that I'll, I'll throw out about that when we get to the Q&A. But now uh, we have, of course, uh, you know, Brother Ernest Miller, and uh, you, I believe, are also, you're on the board of, uh, you know, trustees or regents for Lewis University, is that correct? As well as our St. Mary's College uh, in uh, the Bay Area. And I've also served on several of our secondary schools and boards um, as well, but I'm not on a secondary schools board at the moment. Uh, but you, you have that experience. Yeah. Very good. So um, I guess now it's it's uh, the ball's in your court, uh, Brother Ernest. So uh, if you could just give us a few bullet points from from your uh, uh, from your talk, and then we'll, we will kick off the you know the the interaction. <clears throat> Very good, thank you. So I entitled my presentation uh, "Educating for the Reign of God to Teach as Jesus Did," and so I wanted to front. Um, the reign of God, right, um, as the ultimate purpose of Catholic Christian education. And with that as the frame, I sought to spotlight um, the meaningful role that the Catholic education can play through the lens of the Catholic social tradition. Uh, and I divided my presentation into what I call three movements. Um, one was to focus on the biblical foundations of the Catholic social tradition. The second movement was to focus on the call of scripture and the call of the Catholic uh, social tradition um, to us um, as educators. And then the third movement was uh, entitled Reaching New Horizons, Catholic Christian Education, Justice and Hope. And it is in that space that I sought to ever incompletely, ever imperfectly seek to engage that subtitle of the lecture series of faith, mission, um, and pedagogy. So let me just make a, a few points. So first, um, I uh, wanna be clear again about centering the reign of God, that Jesus came to teach and preach the reign of God, that it is here and now. And so part of the uh, undercurrent of my contention is that I don't believe that the Catholic social tradition is taught with the rigor, the intellectual rigor and the contemplative rigor um, that it deserves. Um, and it isn't given the amount of time that it deserves, both on the secondary level and on the higher education level. But the first is to understand the reign of God um, is the primary purpose. If it is Jesus's primary purpose, it is Catholic education's uh, key purpose um, as well. And so with that, um, I put forward uh, Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 20. And that is, it says, justice and only justice shall you pursue. And then um, to sort of conclude the first movement, um, drawing on both Thomas Groom, a uh, leading Catholic educator at Boston College and a student of John Dewey, uh, this notion of funded capital. And I think there is some connection, I think I find there, at least implicitly, with some of what 
uh, Matthew is arguing very persuasively, um, as well as what I'm trying to suggest um, as well. Let me go to uh, highlight, spotlight, what I think is a key text within the Catholic social teaching, um, and that is uh, the 1971 um, Bishop Synod's document, Justice in the World, where it states unequivocally that the preaching, teaching, I add, of the gospel, and I say the word, right? I, I know we front the gospel, but it, it's the preaching and the teaching of the whole word, and I think we give short shrift often to the Hebrew prophets in particular, right? Listening to Jesus' preaching and teaching, he's in knowledge of the Hebrew prophets, right? And so with that, this little document following the Second Vatican Council says that the preaching and the teaching of the gospel um, is a constitutive dimension. That is, the, the, the Catholic social teaching is a constitutive dimension of the preaching and teaching um, of the word, right? So I put that forward, right? That it is a constitutive dimension of the church's mission to be exact, right? And then when we get to New Horizons, I am suggesting the following, and then I will uh, decrease for the moment. And that is, again, borrowing from Thomas Groom, focusing on the role of pedagogy. Uh, he puts forward the notion that the role of pedagogy must be understood as the way to nurture a person's soul, to nurture the journey of life, and as one of my... One of the giants that I studied, um, Dwayne Hubner, says, um, it is on the level of being that life-transforming education and faith unfold. And so what I'm trying to suggest is that, that a focus with rigor on the Catholic social tradition as a centering piece for Catholic education has the capacity to be life-transforming, education in faith that can be life-transforming. And so there I agree with Donna, right? I think she's spot on when she talks about that, how can Catholic education be um, a, an avenue for transforming one in faith, indeed bringing one to faith to give witness to faith. And I'm suggesting that a focus on the Catholic social tradition can help us achieve um, all of these high ends. Well, very good. So I think we, we got a, a very nice encapsulation from all of you. And I think, you know, all of you, I think, increased nicely there uh, in, in giving, you know, the bullet points of, of your talk, which, you know, that's, that's not an easy thing to do to encapsulate, you know, uh, an hour talk into, you know, just a few minutes. Uh, but you know, for the purposes of our, our symposium, it was it was important. So thank you for for all of that. Um, so I think now we'll move into you know the first wave of questions, which is you know questions at intro. That is you know for the presenters to engage one another before we open it up more generally to our our, our audience, and then of course perhaps even myself. So uh, I don't have a specific order here. Um, so who would like to? to ask a, a, a few questions of, of their colleagues here. <clears throat> I have a question for Ernest. So, you know, we both agree that the rigor of the education in our faith is so important. How would you see that coming from the pulpit? I think, and I'm not trying to cast blame or anything, but to read the readings and listen and then have it explained to us is not reaching the heart or the mind in today's society. How would you, what would you suggest? How could we increase that so that the people sitting in the pews walk away feeling that they really have a grasp and know that God is with them? I appreciate your question. Um, isn't our time limited to less than 90 minutes? <laughs> um, two things. One, I contend that there is a dearth of teaching generally, apart from rigor, as regards the Catholic social tradition writ large within Catholic schools generally. And then second, 
I think there is a great absence from the pulpit, right? Um, when we think of the, the book that was written in the 80s, um, the Catholic Social Teaching, The Best Kept Secret, right? One can argue that it remains um, a great kept secret. We, we do not hear an integration of Catholic Social Teaching and the wider Catholic Social Thought being integrated in homiletic reflection. Uh, I mean, I've been around the horn, uh, I think, uh, a lot. I've been in many parish and other liturgical settings to hear homiletic reflections and to hear homilists drawing from the richness of the Catholic Social tradition is very little, uh, few times, right? So, so there's a problem there. And to the degree that there is the absence of preaching, quality preaching from the pulpit, that draws from the wellspring of the Catholic social tradition, we're talking about the, the great body of Christ um, within our Catholic tradition, they don't know these teachings, right? They don't know the richness because there's also the gap in Catholic schools, right? But we gotta also remember that most students do not go to Catholic schools, Right? The majority right, of Catholic age children are not in Catholic schools, even when we had more Catholic schools, still the majority, right? So we have a small lane in which to capture students, in, uh, particularly in the high school level. And I've long said that if we don't capture students on the high school level on, with this rich tradition, um, even if they go to a Catholic college or university, even if they they must self-select. If they don't self-select courses that specifically wrestles with the Catholic social tradition, they will not really know that tradition. And I think that's where we are. So, so I'm pointing out the weakness in school generally. There are exceptions, of course. And then I think there's a weakness in terms of just um, Sunday preaching. Let, let's just leave it to Sunday. Um, and so there, there's a great gap. Right, um, in that regard. So let me pause there. So the need is great, and I guess the only other thing, and and you know, my my two brethren here can fill in if they wish. I get a sense that this is not something that's focused on in priesthood training and priestly training, um, in terms of you know spotlighting the Catholic social tradition, in particular, and homiletic preparation in and of itself. I think my two brothers here, given their education and training on Cornell Avenue in Chicago, might be a little different. Certainly the person that my brother Matthew had <laughs> as homilist at his uh, first mass is a master homilist. So. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Har uh, thank you, Brother Ernest. I, I agree with everything you said. I think the challenge that I have found at as a preacher myself is that people want different things from a homily. And what I have found is that there are few who want teaching. I, I, one of the, th one of the critiques that I have of Catholic preaching to begin with, number one, the, the call for short homilies makes any nuance very difficult. Uh, and, and so I think even as the Holy father asks us to keep, homilies to seven minutes. I mean, it is hard to really do some teach something well in seven minutes. But I, I think the bigger thing that I think many of us have been taught is start with a story, help uh, homily should be motivational and shouldn't be doctrinaire uh, and kind of finish with concluding the story. That's kind of what many of us have been taught. And I think it's not very conducive to homilies that teach. In other words, uh, a, a lot of the ways that uh, many of us have been trained in homiletics or the, the faithful want us or tend to celebrate preaching is when it's emotional and when it is um, motivational, not when it's full of substance. And of course, the ideal would be to do both. And uh, there are many people who can do both. I mean, there are a few people who can do both well. There are many people who could try to do both well and fail. Um, so a lot of what you hear in Catholic homilies, uh, especially from some older priests, you will hear a story, 
uh, kind of a feel good and then finish up with the story because that's the way many of us were taught. I agree wholeheartedly that the pulpit needs to be a place of teaching again, not that it should only be teaching, but that it should be a place where the faithful can be fed. Another challenge that comes with that is because of the diverse backgrounds of the faithful, it's very hard to start somewhere. In other words, if, you know, if you try to launch into uh, any sophistication, you will often hear people say, well, that went over my head. I, I had no idea what you were talking about. So balancing all these things at once is very tricky and it's a self-fulfilling issue. It's a, it's a vicious circle because if you don't start somewhere, it will just keep the, nobody will move anywhere. So sometimes you have to be okay with preaching a little bit over somebody's head. Uh, it, even if it sounds really basic to those who have been trained in theology or understand what Catholic social teaching is or anything else that, the, the basic doctrines of the, the faith, it's it's it can be difficult to start with a congregation, especially if there's low fluency in basic scripture, basic uh, doctrine, basic theology. So I, I don't mean to make excuses. Uh, I, I think a lot of the forces, uh, like keeping homilies short, a, a kind of pushing away from doctrinaire or or overly. Um, uh, things that aren't just emotional feel-good stories a lot of these things are difficult to overcome especially if a priest doesn't have a lot of support uh, and kind of feels pushed but I, I agree it would be the ideal and uh, to to be able to preach uh, homilies that really teach the faithful uh, as well as motivating them it, and God bless those who can and I think for those of those uh, those uh, preachers who can do that, we should lift them up as examples mm -hmm. and use them in preaching courses for the next generation. Yeah, um, I appreciate that, Matt. And just the, just uh, another word of three, perhaps, Donna, um, and I agree with Matthew, um, but some of what I hear you saying brings us back to quality education, right? That when you say that a lot of people in the pews don't have the scripture and other um, background to comprehend certain things, particularly, you know, if, if the homilist is both preaching and teaching, um, I think the two go together, um, there is that gap, right? And and then so we got to say, well, where is Catholic education to be able to close that gap, right? And so I do know, as you do as well, I, I can pinpoint some both Catholic priests and certainly there are a tremendous number of Protestant uh, pastors and ministers who can do that quite well. Um, in respect to the Bishop of Rome, who I'm a great fan, um, I, I, I will say categorically I don't agree with the so-called seven-minute rule, right? Um, right. For some Protestant and even for some of our Catholic priests, right, seven minutes is prologue, um, <laughs> right? So anyway, we don't need to get too much into that, but I think we're pinpointing something important about Catholic education, right? And in preparation for my doctoral thesis, in fact, I tried to do a survey of, of schools, particularly secondary schools, who teach liturgy. I think I found one. And teaching sacraments is not teaching liturgy. Right? So there's a gap. Yeah. I would, I would say one thing is that a, you know, you mentioned like, uh, you know, preachers and Protestant traditions versus Catholic is that a homily and a sermon are not, those are, those are different modalities. Uh, I accept that. Okay, so you know, so that it's a different. It, 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 you're you're challenged in a different way as 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 a as a homilist uh, versus you know giving a sermon. But I think you know the the points are are, are sound there. I, I think the, the the thing that I I'm picking up that you said, Ernest, that you know something that for some reason I didn't think about uh, maybe as as much as I, I should have at different points is the, the idea of the, that 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 very thin lane. Is that even in the quote unquote golden age of Catholic education, whenever that was and whatever that was, you're still dealing, even within Catholics, a small segment of the population. You know, and I think about like my, my grandparents who were, you know, the children of immigrants, you know, none of them during the Depression, none of them even went to high school. If they had a year or two of junior high, you know, you know, they were really fortunate and then they all had to go to work because everybody was broke. So, you know, they didn't have the benefit. 
you know, of, of any sort of uh, secondary ed in a Catholic school, even though they were cradle Catholics, let alone even college, you know. And so I think the, the question would be then is thinking of Catholic education perhaps at the secondary level as well as at the collegiate or university level, you know, and also based on, you know, the, the, the types of things that, as, you know, Brother Ernest, you were saying, you know, the things that we should be, you know, tapping into, the richness of, of you know, Catholic social teaching, everything that goes with that, the idea of, of mission, what is education for, is, is really to think about the people that, you know, who fortunately are blessed with the resources, either through their family or their, their, their own selves, to go to, a, you know, a Catholic, uh, you know, high school or go to ultimately, a, you know, a Catholic uh, a college or university, that those institutions should therefore be forming these young men and women, uh, you know, for leadership. You know, that the idea that if you are fortunate enough through your family or through, you know, your own resources or, or accident or birth, what have you, to go to, through a Catholic school system and maybe go to a university, uh, you know, you know, and that's an elective. It's not a public school. That's that's a choice that your your family or that you're making. If 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 you're a college age student, then that institution should take that then as a challenge. That okay, this is th these are a, a select few people that have have this opportunity. We should give them everything to form them in accordance with you know these at least you know purportedly universal values. Of the church, you know, you know, in terms of ethics, in terms of theology, in terms of all the things that you know that they will need to be equipped to navigate a world that is increasingly antithetical in many ways to what I would consider Catholic values, um, you know, and so that they are being trained in a sense to be teachers and and and, and ministers to you know you know Christians to Catholics really to anybody who who does not have the opportunity they have i think what's you know from the gospel you know you know from those to whom much is given much is expected you know uh if i recall it correctly um and so maybe that would be we think about what is catholic education for what you know what is the drill down you know in terms of you know what you know teachers and, and administrators and so forth the catholic institutions are trying to do it's to create that next generation of, of leaders, not just giving people a good education so they can get a good Fortune 500 job or, you know, and make a lot of money and so on and so forth, or, you know, have really awesome fraternity brothers, but rather, you know, you're then, in a sense, you're being commissioned to do something, you know, much greater, you know, that's not just about you and not just about you making money, you know, and so I think in, in to sort of go back to where, you know, you were you know, talking about from your uh, experience as, as superintendent as well as, as, as an instructor, you know, one of the things I hear a lot is this notion of even in, within the public education system, and I was having a debate with a former CNM colleague about this just, you know, last the other week, is this notion of, you know, people looking at educators, you know, even in the public school system is that, well, you're just indoctrinating students. Mm -hmm. You're, just, you're indoctrinating my son, you're indoctrinating my daughter, you know, in, you know, whether it be on, on kind of more of the woke end of the spectrum, which is there's that criticism, or then if, if you're in a Catholic school, then people are accusing you of being, you know, some sort of right wing reactionary, you know, obviously people may hurl those accusations without a lot of nuance or data. But I was thinking to what extent, if you are working in a Catholic education system, you know, as opposed to being on defense, do you say, you know, you use the word, Matthew, I think, doctrinaire, I was thinking, but ultimately, in a, I would say, in a constructive sense, to what extent are you supposed to be, in a way, indoctrinating students? That is, training them to assume their mantle, to, to take up their cross when they leave that institution, so that, again, they can, they can diffuse those values, you know, you know throughout the world. Uh, that if, if somebody, you know, goes in and says to an instructor, it's like, well, you know, you're indoctrinating, you know, you know, students, you know, and that's a pejorative, you say, well, actually, thank you, because then it means I'm doing my job. Uh, that's just one take on it, but I'm just kind of curious to see what, what uh, you guys think of that. Well, I think you have to be careful with indoctrinating only because the, the word, uh, has connotations of uncritical reception on the on behalf of the student, and I think we don't we don't want that, especially in a higher education uh, circumstance where we really want people to be embracing the these values and hopefully and perhaps even the faith, uh, 
uh, definitely the faith uh, with with as much freedom as as we can give them, uh, especially through like things like the liberal arts, which are supposed to help us become more free through our our study. Um, but I, I do agree. I, I think one of the challenges that kind of hits the ground, especially in higher education, though I think it may be becoming a bigger thing in many Catholic schools that are secondary and primary ed too, is uh, a lot of our students are no longer Catholic. Um, so St. Norbert College, I think, uh, uh, is around 40% Catholic, perhaps. I think uh, that would be common for a lot of Catholic colleges uh, throughout the, the, the country. So uh, I, I think part of it is educating the ignorant is one of the spiritual works of mercy. We, we educate for the sake of, 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 of their good, independent of any, um, uh, independent of any uh, agenda on our place. But I do think it is a beautiful thing that we try to show them the Lord Jesus and and his saving message and the values that come from the traditions that form those so that they can become future leaders as well. So I agree with you for sure in that respect. Um, and I think it's something that we have to continue to do. I think one of the challenges that emerges I think Brother Ernest will be very familiar with this, as well as you, Donna, I think, as a superintendent, is you can have these high ideals about what Catholic education should be, but integrating that throughout an institution can be very difficult. In other words, the administrators of of a, a group may be able to talk a big game, but if it's not going through the faculty and it's not going through the staff, uh, it, it's very difficult to make that come to life. And so I think while a lot of administrators will, will agree with much of what we're saying here, the real crux of this question comes, how do you get buy-in from the people that are actually teaching the students? So that when you're teaching biology or theology or English or math, uh, that these ideas, that these values that, that the Lord Jesus is shining through those classrooms because that's not an easy thing today. So I agree with you, Steve, uh, Father Stephen, uh, in that, you know, I think infusing these values and having them take these values out into the world is our primary agenda. But I think the the difficulty is how to make that happen. Yeah. I have a follow up to that, but I want to get, get some other thoughts here in, into the, into the mix. Do you want to respond next, Donna, before I speak? I could see it looks like you had something you wanted to say, so go ahead. No, no, I, I want to defer to you first. <laughs> well, I think, you know, one of the things in our schools is we do catechize to the teachers every year. They are required to do certification. But again, if they're just checking the box, it, it's, it could not be the, the perfect setting that we really want or the outcome that we want where they are truly not indoctrinating, but um, proselytizing to, to the children and living their faith. And that's one thing with, well, I think with all of us, we have that opportunity to, to practice what we're preaching by taking them to the world around us, whether we're working at the homeless center or doing collection for the homeless, feeding the poor. Um, you know, there's so many examples that we could do to teach what, you know, to really teach like Jesus taught, but trying to get buy-in and dealing with safety factors and other issues like that, it, it does challenge us. I, I agree. Um, two observations. Um, one is to piggyback on the, the last observations uh, you were making, Matthew, and that is, and it's part of actually part of my work. So part of my work um, under the umbrella of the Adrian Nail Project within our Office for Mission and Ministry for our East Coast uh, province is um, mission education and formation. Right. Um, so so that is an important issue. 
I also agree that it, it's not about doctrinaire or indoctrination, right? I would say that's not the the uh, le no juice, the right word, the right concept. For our founder, John Baptist Saint, John Baptist de La Salle, the patron saint of teachers of youth, and for and resident within our Lasallian charism and mission is the notion that education and evangelization are two dimensions of the same coin, right? So for our founder, there was not a divide between education and evangelization. They, they went together, they go together, right? And of course, evangelization is not proselytizing. Evangelization in our country is to all. Those uh, within our uh, company, within those students who are entrusted to our care, whether they are the Catholic Christian tradition or not, how do we, because of who we are as Catholic Lasallian schools and so on and so forth, as Catholic Jesuit schools, et cetera, et cetera, as Catholic Novartine schools, how do we give witness to the reign of God, right, which includes all, right? So I, I think that the, the key term, concept, and practice is evangelization again high to education right? um, the two go together oh, so. good point so that it, it, so this notion of you know indoctrination that you know that it, it's there's 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 a, a pejorative in that that's a little bit too strong it sounds like um for for folks i mean uh, I, hopefully yeah. by the the grace of our witness by the strength um, and rigor of our teaching that we are able to educate and evangelize, and evangelize, right? As Paul says, right, we are planting the seed, right? But ultimately, it is God's grace and mercy that uh, makes the plants grow. And so we don't always see immediately the fruits of our labor, right? But we have the high task uh, as ministers of the gospel to ministers of the word to plant the seeds through uh, quality Catholic Christian education and evangelization. Yeah, I was I was thinking, and this this came later. It was you know it was after Matthew's talk, but I remember you know I, you know the way I think about these things now versus say 15 years ago when I entered into novitiate is is significantly different. And I remember you know we we had a lot of conversations at the beginning of formation. I think Matthew can remember some of those um, fond exchanges. And <laughs> and uh, but I remember something very specifically. We were talking about the idea of you know. You know, you know, some people, even within the church, you know, some people think this, they interpret things this way, some people interpret things that way, you know, whether you're talking about philosophy, whether you're talking about theology, whether you're talking about doctrine, what have you. And, uh, and so, and, and so one of the things that I remember always thinking, you know, having come out of a, more of a public school system uh, for, for higher ed, you know, for the most part, was, you know, well, you know that the, there is a relative component depending on somebody's experience you did you know outlook you know social location i think is, is a word we would use now you know people are going to view things differently and so it's all just kind of well even within the church we you know live and let live my understanding of social justice is this somebody else understanding of so the mission of social justice or evangelization is that and then we all just kind of go our separate ways and you know, you know remain friends and so forth and i think actually with matthew had made made a comment you know, uh, you know, based in, you know, church teaching saying, but, you know, as Catholics, we do ultimately believe that truth is knowable. You know, I, I don't know if you remember that conversation at all, but, but then there was something else that, that, you know, I think it was, it was in that conversation, maybe it was in a follow on conversation about like, well, somebody's doesn't believe this or somebody is, you know, isn't on the same page with that. And then, you know, as an educator, what do you do with that? My view, I think, for a long time was, well, that's what they believe, and you know, why should I I lose sleep over it? And I think I don't want to put words in your mouth, Matthew, but I think you know, and this is 15 years ago. This is we're all in different places now, but but I think, but you you sort of put it in in kind of a sort of a, a Thomistic, you know, questio, as it were, where, where you said, but you know, is it not wrong to allow one to persist in error? I think was how you put it, or something like that. Okay. And, uh, and I think, you know, and so I, at the time I didn't really buy it, but now it's, I, I was, I've been thinking about it in the, the sense of, you know, within the context of, you know, 
education, what is Catholic education for, you know, what is the pedagogy, what is the end in view, I think, you know, from an ethical perspective, is to send, you know, that if, if students are coming through and we give them the tools to succeed, we give them the tools to maybe, as you were talking about, Matthew, not just indoctrination, but the, the sense of a critical faculty, that then in, in, with, with an augmented freedom that they get through their education, that they can make, you know, good decisions. But I think, you know, the thing is, if somebody come, whether it be a, a, a secondary ed system, whether it be a, a college or university, you know, Catholic school, somebody comes through there and they come through that system coming to some very, very, you know, I would say problematic conclusions. You know, the question would be is, well, is in freedom, is that kind of where that's just kind of where they're at and we wash our hands of it or at some point. And this, this is, you know, open question is, is the Catholic school system there? You talked about narrowing the lane earnest. I'm going to use that in a different, you know, capacity here. Is it ultimately to say, no, there are certain conclusions that one ought not to come to, you know, with, with respect to certain social issues or other things like that. And so th this is where it gets controversial, this idea of indoctrination versus critical thinking or a Catholic methodology. So just kind of throwing that out there to all of you, uh, you know, from your various perspectives, just to, to sort of see what, 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 you know, how you run with, with that topic. <clears throat> I mean, I think, I think, of course, we have, I liked what Brother Ernest said in his talk about, um, about the ecclesial dimension of education. And um, that can mean a lot of different things. I think I think one of the things that sometimes can get lost uh, in, especially in higher education, is to remember that what we are doing is a ministry of the church, um, and that the church is uh, is the body of Christ that preaches uh, preaches the truth about Christ and who He is and the reign of God, preaching, preaching this reign. And so, yes, I think Catholic educators have an obligation to preach the truth. Uh, I, I, and I think, you know, there's that old Jesuit saying, I think it was like, give me your child at seven and I'll show you the man, which, which was like this um, saying that, like, if you, if you hand your child over to Jesuit education, you can be sure that at the end of it, they will be a mature Christian man. Like they will, they will, this education is so good that they will come out this great product. I think one of the things, of course, today you can't control the outcome of your education. I think there will be a diversity of people who come into your college and a, or a university and a, a diversity of people who leave it. And uh, hopefully we are informing consciences and preaching the truth, exposing them to the truth so that they can use, uh, so that with their own free will, they can, can make decisions and be prepared to have that contemplative vision to kind of understand uh, at least where the church is coming from at the very least, but hopefully that they can, uh, by grace, come to the gift of faith, which again is, is a, a theological virtue, not a not a natural one. So that comes from grace and not through human will. Um, so, yeah, I, I agree with you, Father Stephen, that, yes, there's an obligation for Catholic schools as a minis as ministries of the body of Christ, as ministries of the body of Christ, that they are to teach and preach the good news and the reign of God. That is why they exist. Uh, but I think we, we want to we want to have graduates that, like from a De La Salle school, that embody the De La Salle charism and a Catholic, uh, a Catholic worldview as well. The same thing with Norbertines. We want them to live out those Norbertine values and Catholic values. But ultimately, we hand that over to God, and we do what we can do to 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 be a ministry of the church uh, and to preach the truth, to expose them to the truth, to give them the tools that they need to contemplate the big questions in life and then let the Lord take over from there. I, I would only add that um, I appreciate the reference to the ecclesial dimension um, and to pinpoint the Vatican uh, 
text on uh, a Catholic education. It, again, it's a it's a thin document, but a significant document that I think many in Catholic education themselves are uh, ignorant of. Um, but it emphasizes um, this very point that Catholic education, Catholic schools are a ministry of the church, and that is significant. Um, and thus, it further elevates um, the significance of, you know, the, our focus through this uh, lecture series um, and beyond, uh, right, of what is happening in uh, Catholic education right now in our country. I, well, I was, I was thinking, uh, if, if without objection, if, if uh, we could open this up to our, our, our audience here that's on site and see if, if they have any questions for, uh, for all of you, um, uh, either in mass or, or, or one at a time. And so uh, I think uh, I'll put you guys on the spot here. Um, you guys have any questions for our, our presenters? Yes. Yeah, when we were talking about the difficulties of, uh, uh, um, for lack of a better term, buy-in by our faculty, um, I know one of the issues that we have at, at, the, at the lower levels, uh, and per perhaps at the university level as well, is uh, finding teachers, finding qualified teachers. And because of the difficulty, finding Catholic teachers. And so many of our schools have teachers that aren't even Catholic, and, and we're trying to find out how do we teach Catholic values when we don't have Catholic teachers. Um, and I was wondering, how, how do you see that in our schools today, in the secondary and elementary schools? Well, the way I see that right now is if they are to teach religion, they have to be practicing Catholics. And that requires a letter from their pastor as well um, and certified. Um, however, it is more and more of a challenge because of the disparity between salary of a public school could be 80,000 or more and in a Catholic school would be 35, 36,000. And people are like, wow, how can you do that? Well, again, it's a calling. It's a ministry. And some people are able to do that and they have for many years, but in today's world, it's, it's harder and harder. Um, I was just trying to hire somebody not too long ago and she told me, oh, I have three children I have to feed. And I said, I'm so sorry. Um, we would love for you to be here, but if that is not going to meet your needs at this time, then we'll pray about it. And perhaps there will be a change that someday we can afford. And people say, why is, it's so expensive. Well, our average here in Albuquerque, it's maybe $5,000 a student. It varies from 4,800 to 6,800, so maybe a little bit higher. But back when it wasn't, we had nuns and they got $25 a month stipend and they had lived together in communion in their convent. And so, or, you know, we had single women that taught, um, they, it was affordable then. It was because people loved their church, loved their faith, and wanted to share that love of God with their community. We're finding that more and more difficult in today's world. So one of my questions is, how Catholic schools in the future? Unfortunately, our diocese is unfortunately having to close one of our schools that has a very rich history here in Albuquerque. And it's just fewer of our Catholic families are sending their kids to a Catholic school. So that, that is a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot there, Donna. Um, and I also, in listening to the question, I'll get to the heart of it. But, uh, you know, the fact that men and women religious in particular, and so including brothers, um, right, we, we, for a long time, staff, large numbers of grammar schools as well. In fact, for my, for the Dulles Tower Brothers, our beginnings is in grammar schools, right? That, that was our origins, and most of our brothers were in grammar schools until the early 20th century, including here in the U.S. So that was an era, and I, I don't think we should justify, you know, 
today when we look back, right, that, that and and drawing on Catholic social teaching, that $25 a day or whatever was, was not right. A month. Right? A because, month. <laughs> because men and women religious were in some ways just seen as a workforce. Yes. And I would say that is in contrast to Father Matthews the, at the heart of his focus on contemplation in, in a certain sense, right? I don't, I don't want to make it too complicated, right? But um, but be as may. So let me just make that point, right? Um, we, we certainly cannot go back to that, right? Of men and women religious just being a labor force, right? That is wrong. Um, I don't believe that it is necessary Right. If, if the if the questioner is saying that theoretically most, if not all, teachers in the Catholic school should be Catholic, I personally don't agree with that proposition. Right. Indeed, I know, right, people of other Christian traditions and people who are not of Christian traditions, both on the secondary level and in our college spaces, who are great witnesses to both Lasallian Catholic values. Right. And again, when we talk about Norbertine values and Jesuit values, right. They're nuances, right? We're ultimately all trying to make the reign of God real right here, right now, right? And we have nuances and different emphases and so on and so forth, right? Okay, just to speak in general terms. Um, so I don't think that is a requirement. Now, I know it is a requirement in religion, but I'm going to be honest, right? You said right earlier, Don, about, you know, checking a box. To be honest, just because someone is nominally Catholic doesn't mean that they're qualified to teach re religion, religious education. I, 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 you know, th this is this is getting into an area where I pay a lot of close attention, right? And part of my doctoral thesis is on this issue that when it comes to religious education, that it doesn't, we don't give the same attention as to the quality of teachers we're expecting for the secular subject. Right, because it's religion, right? And that creates a whole cascade effect of how students approach religious education, right? Now, we need a whole nother symposium on that subject, right? The final thing I would say, even for school leaders, right, for the head of school, be it, you know, in some schools it's the president, in some places it's the principal, and there's a requirement that that person needs to be Catholic, right? Okay, so there it is. But I can pinpoint situations where that is a fig leaf. Right, someone is nominally Catholic, and in a case of my own alma mater in New Orleans, where a former graduate who is not Roman Catholic, he's United Methodist, was initially a candidate to become the headmaster, the head of school, but ultimately, because he's not Roman Catholic, he couldn't continue in the process, right? But a grad, another graduate was chosen who at best was nominally Catholic, and the person who was United Methodist knows the Catholic tradition better than the Roman Catholic. <laughs> so, so, right, that, so that, so, but we don't wrestle with those things. We just say someone has to be Catholic. Well, what does that mean on whatever level, elementary, secondary, college? What, what does that mean? What, how does one prove? Is it just because they are registered in a parish? Right, so I, I continue to wrestle with those issues in my own mind, given, you know, my current post. And even if I wasn't in my my current post, so so there's a lot there. Um, but I think that's an important question with with many layers. And you know, I, my hat is off to people like yourself, Donna, as a superintendent. You know, who has to wrestle with these issues of cost, right? Um, yeah, I mean, we have secondary schools here in our in my province. You know, where you know, the tuition is twenty seven thousand five, and that. That's on the low end of, say, the Philadelphia market of independent schools, faith-based and secular, right? Um, but for a LaSalle school, that is expensive, but that's the nature of the market. Does it give a lot of financial aid? Yes, it does, because it has the capacity to do that. But one of the questions I wanted to ask you, Don, and then I will um, give space, is, you know, as you said, when we were together, um, when I was there in February, what are we to do, right? You started off wonderfully by noting the importance of Catholic schools, and yet we are in a downward spiral of schools closing, right? Someone would say here in New York City, should Catholic schools be closing with all the resources that are here, right? The owner of Madison Square Garden, Roman Catholic, pays no taxes on Madison Square Garden, right? 
So there are resources here. So do we need to figure out a, a, a more prophetic strategy to keep Catholic schools open? Because they are a great evangelizer, and I probably would not be where I am today if it was not for Catholic education. And I started in Catholic education as United Methodist. I guess they. We do need to find a solution. You're absolutely right. And it's just, um, you know, I look at just in our archdiocese, we have 4,000 students in our Catholic schools. If you look at the whole state of New Mexico, there's about 8,000 students total in the whole state of Catholic, in our Catholic schools. So if you were to look then at the, the latest st statistics tells us that the state of New Mexico is putting out approximately $30,000 per student to educate them. That's for the ones that are in their public schools. So, I mean, let's do the math. Eight times 30,000. You're going to get eight times three is 24. $240 million is what our Catholic schools are saving the state of New Mexico because they are not funding our children. If we could get them to fund a certain percent, that would allow more children to attend and us to pay a living wage to our teachers, to get highly qualified teachers in our school. There are so many teachers in the public school system that want to be in our schools, but we can't pay them enough to feed their family. That's social injustice right there. And I've been fighting the legislature for years. I'm going back at it again this year. I'm not giving up, but I mean, this is, this is very unjust and it needs to be addressed. Well, the other thing you said there, this notion of qualified, and I think this, this goes on, I think was some of the things that Brother Ernest was saying is that, you know, we talk about there were times where you had all these nuns and, and brothers and priests that could, that would staff the schools and they, you know, they wouldn't really draw a salary as such, you know, and so the school could afford to, to stay open and so forth. But I, would, and I know a, a woman that was a Dominican many, many, many years ago in, you know, uh, in the 60s. And, and so that would, you know, when you were a novice for a year or whatever, and then, you know, if you had a year or two or college or, or, or the equivalent, then, you know, that teaching was their ministry, then they, they, they threw you into a school, uh, you know, a, a primary school or a secondary school in, you know, one of the Dominican schools um, and, you know, Catholic schools. And you didn't have a teaching certificate. You didn't necessarily have any training. It was just go and do it. And and so even you know I'm not saying that the, you know the sisters weren't intelligent or whatever, but they weren't prepared. You know they weren't prepared. You know you know pedagogically or otherwise really you know to do that. You know they they weren't just you know like today you know you, you get a you know for public schools whatever you get a certificate. You know, in in uh, you know for you know university instructors. I mean, most will, when they're in graduate school, they go through an apprenticeship. You're a, you're a teaching assistant. You you gradually learn the trade. How do you you know how do you manage a classroom, so on and so forth. You know, it's even more complicated at primary and secondary level. So I think that's that's the trade-off too. Is that you know we, we talk about the labor being worthy of, of their hire, you know, on a, a justice level, but just on a practical and professional level. You know, you, you roll the, the clock back, I would say, you know, depending on, on the pool of religious that would be staffing a school as instructors, there, there's a possibility you might not have been getting a very good education just because you, you would have had a brother, a sister, or a priest that didn't have a lot of training as an educator trying to run a class. And it doesn't always work that well. <clears throat> I think, I think uh, the, the, pushback there though is that at least in those days the children had in front of them symbols of the faith and uh, members of religious orders that they got to know personally and uh, I think that's one of the things that so I think brother Ernest and I differ a little bit on the question about the importance of uh, Catholics leading in the classroom 
and and some of the intangibles that come along with that that don't just relate to the content matter of what one is teaching. So you can be a great math teacher, but if you have a sister who's a math teacher that's teaching you, and especially if she's wearing a habit, and you're you're you get to know this person, and you're there's there's something that is communicated there that's not related to math, and that's not directly communicated through speech, but is intangibly communicated through number one, a contemplative way of life that these religious were living, uh, a personal relationship with the Lord that was being, that kind of came through in small little ways. I, I think that was part of the magic of those days, even though it was built on the backs of kind of an unjust uh, attitude towards some of these religious but I, I do think there is something about the danger. So I, I understand, uh, to go back to the earlier debate, uh, uh, I understand the HR issue. Like if you can't check a box and we, if you took a poll of Catholics in the United States and you had, and you asked them any question on any doctrine of the Catholic faith, even if they were all confirmed Catholics, they'd all differ anyways, right? Like, it's not like American Catholics have a unified voice or or all agree uh, seamlessly with what the church teaches or even lives an intentional uh, faith. So I, I, I totally agree that just the a Catholic requirement can, can be shallow and uh, not always the most helpful. But I do think that if we're not looking at Catholic education as primarily a way to get into a really good college or to have a Cadillac of an education. If the intention of a Catholic education is a way of seeing the world through contemplation or a way of bringing about the reign of God to catch uh, Ernest, brother Ernest talk or to, to find purpose in life. Like Donna talked about any, any of these things, you don't necessarily need a Cadillac education. What you need is a lived example of the faith. And adults who you interact with who aren't your parents, who can be witnesses to that faith. Does that mean you have to be Catholic? No, I don't, I don't believe that. Uh, and so I'm sympathetic somewhat to what Brother Ernest was saying. But I do think there is something powerful about someone who is in love with the Lord and actually believes what they are saying when they talk about, when they're teaching about the Immaculate Conception, when they're teaching about the Eucharist, to hear somebody talk about that when they actually believe it, communicate something intangible. I think that's the magic of Catholic education. And, and it also is one of the great challenges because how do you, from an HR hiring perspective, how do you find a person like that? I don't know the answer to that. Um, that's my two cents. Sure. Um, I, I largely agree with you, my brother. Of course, you know, in the case of, you know, teaching history, right? Again, let me let me pull back and say this, right? One of the things that I think Thomas Groom keynotes well is this notion that the reign of God um, should inform the whole curriculum, right? Mm -hmm. He's very strong in that point, right? Um, and in different language, right, not in the high highfalutin theological language that we have today, our founder uh, makes a similar case, uh, right? So with that said, right, irrespective if one is a vowed religious and or diocesan priest, right, uh, because the vast majority of Catholic educators are not, um, right, I, I think you would agree, right, that uh, that you know, laymen and women, and we got to remind ourselves, brothers and sisters are lay, right? That, that, that's a whole other issue, right? But can also achieve through God's grace what you are contending, right? By giving witness to the faith, right? Um, across the curriculum, right? Um, and I, and again, I think that's another area of weakness, right? Which also goes to how do we continue in our various charismatic um, context to um, to provide mission education and formation, as we like to say, for our as we call them Lasallian partners, right? But but it's it's but it's a co responsibility, right? It's both our brothers as well as our Lasallian partners, and whatever the charismatic 
uh, context might be. And in the case of many diocesan settings, right, there is no charismatic community, right? So that, that there's another, I think, data um, uh, challenge there, right? Because I think there have been studies um, that suggest um, that, you know, those uh, educational settings that are connected to a sponsoring religious institute and allowing its charism to inform the the educational community, that there's some appreciable difference, right, um, generally speaking. Uh, but be as it may, we, we, we all have a heavy task, um, irrespective of what our immediate uh, Catholic setting um, is. Um, so, so, I, so I agree generally with what is uh, being offered. I, uh, it, let me know, um, Father Stephen, whether there are other questions, because I have a question I want to pose to uh, our friends in this conference. I'm sure you do. Um, well, let me let me ask any any anybody uh, else want to ask a, a a question of one or all of our presenters. I want to ask uh, Brother Ernest. Um, I absolutely agree that uh, higher education, Catholic education, can um, uh, make use of Catholic social teaching to transform society and. Uh, but how do you do this if uh, this is kind of like uh, it has become a way to increase the divide between Catholics here in the U.S.? Because these are terms that get like politicized. Mm -hmm. and how do you do that in a classroom? So I assume you are talking more narrowly about some, a few hot button issues, right? Um, in regards to Catholic moral theology, and again, it's not just Catholic, right? I, I think you're talking about abortion and LGBTQ concerns, right? Um, as social justice issues. in general, yeah. Say again? Social justice. Yeah, social, ju yeah, it, yeah, the very term, the very concept in some circles, right? Um, social justice has been, um, is seen as an uh, as an ideological uh, right. exercise. If you are you 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 are correct. Um, I say just in short here that first and foremost we have to be clear about what to what and for what are we witnessing. Right, that Catholic social teaching is part of the social doctrine of the church. Right, um, and. Catholic social teaching, as I thought to uh, make note in the first section uh, of my presentation in February, is biblically centered, right? That, that, that's key. And, and, and so that is where one has to start with knowledge and understanding, right? To push forward just a bit, I think where even within intra- Right, even within church circles itself, um, we can get a little queasy about some of uh, uh, social justice issues because we get caught in the trap that it's becoming partisan. Right, Thomas Groom and other sources are very clear. Right, um, and just on Friday, our brother Vicar General who is well-educated, he's from Columbia, but he knows the U.S. context very well and other contexts. Education is political. Doesn't mean it's partisan, but we have to understand that education is political because it has to do with the common good, right? And so I think where part of the, the tension comes is that um, we... Some see it as becoming partisan and it falls in certain ideological buckets, right? And we got to pull back from that. And we got to, some um, commentators, some writers will distinguish um, advocacy, right? That, that, that what we are about in advo is advocating, and they make a distinction between advocacy and lobbying, right? But we don't need to get into all of that. But advocacy is being involved in and for the common good, right? So let me just answer it uh, that way. I think you're, 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 it's an important question. 
Uh, but we got to make sure that we are first and foremost understanding what grounds the Catholic social teaching and Catholic social tradition writ large and what and for what end, right, are we advocating on a variety of issues that falls under the broad umbrella of, of, uh, of justice, peace, and integrity for creation. So thanks. And I, I just, you know, throw on to that, you, you mentioned the, you know, the politicized context that unfortunately we sort of find ourselves in, though I maybe, like you say, Brother Ernest, it was always already political, but, you know, it, it seems to me, my, at least my impression is, uh, you know, that when, when you throw, like, within the Catholic context now, you throw the word, you know, the term social justice out there, that already seems to be, for some, a dog whistle. You know, you know, it's like so that you're, you're if you, you say social justice, you're a progressive Catholic. If we use it, we talk about, you know, you know, Catholic moral teaching or Catholic doctrine, then you're you're, you're, you're traditionalist or whatever. So, not, you know, and I think that's overly simplistic as, as a binary. But I, I think that's in a sense kind of what that what that alludes to, you know, to an extent. Um, I think. Ernest, you had a question for Matt. Well, can, can I just say something quickly? Oh, sure, I, I think, yes. I think part of what needs to happen is to preach the truth in season and out of season. And if I, I can't shy away from from social justice and from the Catholic social teaching because it might be polit politically it might it might be perceived as polarizing and i nor can i stop preaching about abortion because it might be polarizing i think there is an obligation to preach the whole truth in season and out of season and i think especially this is one of the reasons why catholic education can be so important is because it can dispel those myths of polarization like the catholic church doesn't fit into any political party it doesn't fit into uh any of these polarized divisions it it's preaching the truth is what we believe as catholics right and so i think we shouldn't be afraid of the truth no matter we of course we have to be sensitive to our listeners and and understand that a message has to be received when we're preaching i don't mean to suggest that but nor do i think we can just avoid it to to kind of prevent people from feeling shaky because I think as brother Ernest said I think in his talk too like there is an element to which education unsettles us right it, it is something that shakes us out of the categories we thought we once knew that's one of the purposes of education in the first excuse me of the first place is to let the truth break apart these artificial divisions and polarizations so I, I think if I think if somebody who was nervous about um, or somebody who had that that image in their head that Catholic social teaching was only for the left, if they read Catholic social teaching, I think they find that it's it's not that at all. Uh, the same thing with other documents of the church. The, the church is, as Ernest said, it's it's coming from scripture. It's coming from the heart of the church and from a very consistent uh consistent way of thinking uh, that that travels throughout all the church's teachings. So back to just, I'm going to throw a cherry on that if I could, so that, you know, to encapsulate that, that, you know, the, that would follow from I think, the premise that truth is both knowable and teachable. Yes. Okay. Yes. I, I just wanted to add two points. One is uh, particularly to the questioner, um, if she's not familiar with the, the, the long running um, common good, uh, common ground initiative that Cardinal Bernadine uh, started, the former uh, Cardinal Archbishop of Chicago, that, that project continues. It doesn't have the, the same level of attention that it, it got early on, but that common ground uh, initiative can, continues right and Part of what the Common Ground Initiative is about is the so-called seamless garment, um, right? So, so that's one point I wanted to make. And second is though, you know, the, the, the institutional church itself is, is not, does not belong to any political party anywhere um, in any nation, I think we do have to be honest, and this requires another symposium, 
um, that there is in our current political winds, um, in this current uh, moment in our democratic experiment, that there is, the evidence is clear, right? There, there are identifiable groups who bear the name Catholic, Roman Catholic, who are squarely situated in, in various political camps. Um, so we cannot um, avoid that. Um, and, you know, just to just to say that that that, that is happening right now. It's not necessarily the institutional church, but these are book carrying, card carrying Roman Catholics who are squarely, fully in certain, um, I will say, dangerous camps. Um, so I, I wanted to because I, I think. Well, Matthew, that your presentation, again, I appreciate it greatly. Um, particularly, uh, I'll start off by saying within our own LaSallian household, there is a, uh, a renewed attention to LaSallian spirituality, right? We There's a great focus on do, 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 right? Mission, 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 right? We have a, uh, right? Um, and so to that end, here's the question. Are you saying at the end of the day that the Mary position is better than the Martha position? Or as some scripture commentators will say, is not either or, is both and, right? Um, so let me just ask that question in that simple way. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think... I think the Mary position is, I, I think it, it, there needs to be a lot of defining of the, the context, I think, before I answer, because I do want to say that the contemplative um, sitting at the feet of the Lord is the highest thing, the highest thing that a human being can do. Um, so, it, but that doesn't mean that it's an either or. That doesn't mean that a life lived only doing that is is better than a life only in action. Uh, I, I think what I what I attempt to mean is that amidst action and contemplation, there is a primacy of contemplation. Uh, this goes back to those old debates between Colonel Ratzinger and uh, Gustavo Gutierrez around orthodoxy versus orthopraxis and which one takes primacy over the other. The primacy of the contemplative does not negate the importance of the active. Uh, rather, the contemplative is what fuels the active, and then the active feed ba feeds back to fuel the contemplative. So it's really not either or. I, I think where my target was there was a kind of culture that I have witnessed in education which tries to take the values from, from Catholicism and from a sponsoring religious order and secularize them to make them just pure value. So like I use the example, I think, of the business leader. We want to make you an ethical business leader, but everybody wants to make you an ethical business leader. If you go to us, if you go to UW Madison, they will want they will say that they are trying to make you an ethical business leader. I think what has to be different about Catholic education is that we are training them to see with the eyes of Christ. And so it's it's first that seeing that then informs the acting. Uh, and so I think listening to your talk, Brother Ernest, I thought we were on similar pages. Um, so it's not to say that the monks are superior to the canons. Uh, because as a canon myself, I would stand with the canonical tradition uh, and Thomas Aquinas, who claims that the canons are the higher, uh, the, the higher form with, with both the action and the contemplation together. But I think the, the danger that I see in Catholic institutions is they publicize the, the ethical without talking about the contemplative. And they think it's making them distinct, but I don't think it often does because they're lacking the explicitly stated pieces that make the ethical make sense uh, instead of just flatly stating the ethical without showing its origin and its source, which is Christ the Lord. So I, I think where my critique is coming from is Catholic universities, Catholic schools 
don't just focus on ethics. You need to say the quiet part out loud. Say where the source of these ethics are coming from and the contemplative vision that allows us these ethics to exist in the first place. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I'm with you. Any other questions for our for our panelists? I have one. It's it's hopefully simple, but I'm just curious to know, you know, obviously the Abbey has some sense of buy-in because we're doing something like this, a lecture series when it comes to this. But what are some unlikely, whether it be institutions or you know, local, even individuals who who would also kind of who should care, right? Like, you know, I'm wondering, you talked about like Let's say I'm a business owner and I'm thinking, oh, that person, you know, has really good ethics. That's that you're saying it's like about them loving Jesus or this other sense. But like, you know, they might not see that. It might be like, oh, well, they, that person really loves Jesus. So I see that difference in that training that they got. So where are some buy-ins from unlikely candidates who could be like, I'm seeing the fruits of that, like in, a, in so, somewhere in the community. So like where we ask that question, you know, why? You know, and I think the buy-in from unlikely candidates is what I'm curious about and what what could they do? Obviously here we're doing this because that's in our capacity, but let's say a bank or what are what are some of the other types of institutions that could be examples of, you know, supporting and then how would they do that? Well, I think even, you know, in biology and, and I mean, even there's so many ethical areas in so many different professions, whether it's biology, robotics, artificial intelligence, you still want to have people that can critically think and make morally objective decisions without being just somebody that's gonna destroy the world because it's going to make that company a lot of money, you know, or whether, I mean, ethics plays a role in so many different areas but our future depends on us being an ethical society or we will destroy the world. And it would be so easy. I mean, even if it's, you know, biological warfare or whatever, um, you know, if we don't have a moral compass, evil will take over this world. And greed and, and, and that will take over. And how would I know as like as unlikely institution that Catholic schools contribute to that. You know, like I'm just trying to know how I would know about that by like for me, I'm learning so much here and I work here at the Abbey, but it's like, how do I, uh, what are some, how do I find out about some of those things? Like, you know, other than interacting with people that have gone through that, is that the main, like how do, how do would someone kind of come to that conclusion that the, con contra the contributing source happened to be that a lot of these, you know, whether it be employees or people I'm interacting with in certain arenas, I'm noticing this trend of them becoming from these, like, you know, where is that kind of something that you, um, or anybody, I guess. It is, I think, I mean, personally, I think science is one of the realms where a lot of our Catholics have gone into, um, which is surprising. And if you look at some of our earlier scientists, they were Catholics, monks, a priest even, but very faithful religious people, you know, our, that made many of our discoveries. Um, but I, I think they're not playing God, but they're using the gifts from God to help society. That's just my two cents worth. Yeah, and I, I think that our graduates speak for themselves too. Like, I think part of the idea is if you've met a graduate from St. Norbert, or De La Salle or the Archdiocese of Santa Fe, uh, hopefully that the education is good enough and, and that we're producing young men and women who are impressive and contributing themselves to society so that they are the ones who open the banks and they are the ones who start the, the businesses and, and contribute to healthcare and, and all the different things that they can do. So I, I think part of the best uh, advertisement for Catholic education are our graduates. Uh, again, I think part of the difficulty, the main difficulty that I think, as Don already said, the main difficulty in, in attracting more people is finances and 
So choice programs are really, as Donna was saying earlier, we have choice in Wisconsin and it has revitalized many of our Catholic schools. Um, but I think in terms of trying to buy buy-in from the local communities, I think most places with Catholic schools, I, I think Catholic schools generally have very good reputations uh, mm -hmm. for producing very good uh, academically excellent students and students of character. Um, and I think it's just those graduates who do our heavy lifting. So if we focus as those of us who are part of our educators, if we focus on a good education that's um, faithful to our mission, then we we should trust that our, our graduates will take that out into the world and their witness will be our greatest advertisement. And I was thinking, you know, the, you know, the, go back to scripture, you know, Jesus says, you will know them by their fruits. Yeah. Right. Uh, and also, but I, you know, to take it, you know, to back up and, you know, into more sort of, uh, you know, sort of general context, uh, a 12 step program grows, uh, as any would say, by attraction rather than promotion. That is, you know, that people see, you know, something, you know, in what somebody has, what somebody's learned, how they live their life, that is so healthy, you know, and you know, radiates a spirituality, a love that is, you know, that is so attractive that they want that for themselves, you know, and then that begins the conversation. Why do you live the way you live? Why do you do what you do? Why do you believe what you believe, you know, in terms of values and spirituality and so forth? You know, and then that's how it grows. I think, you know, we, you know, you mentioned, Matthew, that you would push back, you know, on the, the notion of indoctrination, that that goes a little bit too far, um, you know, from my earlier comments. And I think that if a student is coming out of a Catholic school system, you know, whether it be a, you know, K through 12 or higher education, what, what have you, and, you know, that people see something, that they have acquired something, there is something, there's a gravitas about, you know, how they define themselves as an, as an ethical or moral subject in the world. Uh, again, or the sense that I have of, of, of a formation for leadership, formation, you know, that, that has transcendent values that are, are noticeable, that, you know, at that point, you know, that becomes part of the education. The students that you produce continue the work of the education by the example that they set. You know, but if the students coming out of the school system, a Catholic school system or like any other school system, if there's not something decidedly attractive and healthy about them, you know, or people aren't perceiving something decidedly attractive or healthy about them in terms of how they live their life and how they manifest their values, you know, then then if that's where that's where you encounter, you know, you know, the doubts. That's where you encounter people saying, well, what are people actually learning, you know, and so forth. So I think that the sense of if the school is doing its job, you're, you know, it becomes not to use a kind of a capitalist or marketing term, but the product will sell itself. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> no. Any other questions? Comments? I, I, I must admit, I, I think this was, uh, we've never done this sort of forum before. This is kind of a hybrid forum. Um, but uh, I, I think this was a, a raging success. Um, I, once again, I, I thank, uh, offer thanks to uh, Ms. Illebrun and uh, uh, Father Matthew and Brother Ernest. Thank you for participating in this pilot lecture series program. Uh, I, I'm gonna welcome definitely and solicit actively your feedback for next year um, so that we can make this better. We, we have, I think, a number of suggestions that have sort of come down the pipe, but we wanna continue this because you know, this library, the Norbertine Library here in New Mexico is very much invested in sort of the Catholic education mission, you know, in, in different shapes and sizes and modalities. But nevertheless, uh, you know, this is this is part of what we do. So I think, you know, the uh, to have a lecture series, the pilot lecture series on Catholic education, in a sense, frames our mission, uh, I think, in a very, very special way. So you guys have all contributed something very special that has been memorialized by the grace of God through technology that we've recorded all of these sessions, including this symposium tonight that will go out on social media, or it will live forever, uh, long after we have been called home to the Lord. And uh, so, uh, <laughs> I, it, you know, that's true. Uh, you know, so I think you guys, you have acquitted uh, yourselves well, you've represented yourselves well, I think you, you've represented your institutions. 
your faith, um, you know, all of that, uh, I think in a, in a very unique and special way. So we talk about attraction rather than promotion, what you have done, I think in the course of the work you put into this lecture series and, and the thoughtfulness of your, of your, your discourse and dialogue indeed is, I'd say in all respects, very, very attractive. Um, so thank you, gentlemen. I know you guys on the, on the further time zones away to the east. I mean, it's probably past your bedtime. Um, and so uh, just a quick word of thanks to you oh, for thank you. having the idea and pushing this forward and organizing us for the season. So our thanks to you as well. Well, I appreciate that, sir. And uh Hopefully, uh, in, in whether it be uh, cybernetically or, or in person, that uh, none of you will be a stranger to the to the Norbertine Abbey or the Norbertine Library here, here in Albuquerque. Uh, you guys are always welcome. And again, as you have ideas for future programming, uh, and anybody else out there in, in internet land that is watching this, uh, please uh, pass your ideas along because we want to continue to do these lecture series. Thank you, audience, for, for your thoughtful questions. Mm -hmm.